So, Invincible Season 2 just wrapped up and I absolutely loved it. As a fan of the original comic, I love all the changes that it makes to the source material and the ways that it's adapting the story. My favorite thing about the show is that it's not setting out to replace the original comic. You can watch the show and then read the comic, and while the general story might be the same, the changes that are made allow them to both coexist. And that's gotten so many people into the world of independent, creator-owned comics. And so I want to see more things like it, more indie comics getting adapted into these big projects and bringing more eyes onto the stories. And so here are some indie comics that I think deserve the invincible treatment. Starting with a little independent comic called The Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Oh, what's that? Oh, they're like one of the most successful brands of all time? Oh, they make like a billion dollars a year off of merchandise? Oh, they made Batman like a bunch of times? My bad, everybody. There was a bit of a communication error. The first comic I actually want to talk about is a little book called Spawn. Oh, you've got to be fucking kidding me. This video is brought to you by Factor. Factor delivers fresh, never frozen, dietitian approved meals right to your doorstep. Choose from a weekly menu of 35 options, including calorie smart, keto, protein plus, and vegan and veggie. I've been working on a lot of projects lately that I'm very, very excited about, so I haven't had a ton of time to go grocery shopping and have mainly resorted to just takeout. So Factor has been super helpful for me. The meals are ready in just two minutes, which is way faster than it would take for me to drive to the nearest fast food place. And I know that I'm eating something that's healthy and low in calories with their calorie smart menu. And they taste super good. I normally hate the texture of a lot of microwave meals, but Factor's food feels like it comes straight from a restaurant. Like, no joke, I went to this Italian place with my dad a couple weeks ago, and it's, it's one of my favorite restaurants, and I pulled a Garfield and I ordered some lasagna, and Factor has this beef bolognese on lasagna, and the two were like basically indistinguishable from each other. Factor is owned by HelloFresh, who I've worked with in the past, and the two services work really well in tandem with each other, because some days I have the energy to cook and some days I don't. And it's also super flexible, I can adjust my order size and split up an order to share with my partner, or even skip a week if I need to. Be sure to head to Factor 75.com or click the link below and use code TROYOBOYO50 to get 50% off your first Factor box. Thanks so much to Factor for sponsoring this video and thanks to my patrons who are able to get all my videos early and ad free for just $1 a month. By the way, friend of the channel Godzilla Mendoza just started a campaign to get Marvel to officially release the 1994 Fantastic Four movie, so I wanted to give that a bit of a shout out. He has a whole video on the situation and what happened with that movie, so go check that out when you're done with this and let's see if we can get that thing officially released. Now, the term indie comics has kind of lost its meaning lately. Publications like Image Comics, Dark Horse, and IDW were founded upon the core principle of creator-owned stories. But those publishers have since grown into huge companies that nobody in their right mind would call independent. So indie comics has kind of changed meanings to just mean anything not from the big two, Marvel and DC. But if you want to try something that's legit indie, check out Insane by Tyson Typhoon Andrews. I met Tyson outside of a store one day. He was holding a sign advertising this comic that he made himself, story and art included. We talked a little bit. Turns out he watches the channel and I wanted to try and give him a little bit of a shout out. The book is pretty cool. It's about these two guys, Zero and Zane, who have to escape from a mental asylum, but there's some pretty neat world building thrown in there and some solid twists on the formula, and overall it's a solid read. If you're a fan of indie comics, it quite literally doesn't get more independent than this, so. If you want to check it out, you can find a link to get it digitally, as well as links for all the comics I talk about in the description down below. Most of them are affiliate links, so they do help out the channel, but I would encourage you to support your local comic store if you have one nearby. Also, the books that I talk about on this list, there is a variety of maturity to them. Uh, some of them are for all ages, and then some of them are very, very adult. So I would do a little bit of research and make sure that it's suitable for you before you pick one up. The thing that's been so great about the Invincible show is its characters. The show takes this already great cast from the comics and has made subtle but noticeable changes that have really helped with their depth. Characters like Mark, Nolan, Eve, even William, and so many more have become household names, not just because of the fun costumes, but because of the ways the show uses their flaws and strengths for a greater story. And one book that I think has fantastic characters is Something is Killing the Children, written by James Tynan IV, with art by Werther de la Dera, colors by Mikel Muerto, and letters by And World Design. In the town of Archer's Peak, children have started disappearing. Most of them never return, but the ones that do have horrifying stories that nobody believes. Stories of monsters that live in the shadows that only children can see. And the only person who believes them is a mysterious stranger who comes to town, a monster hunter named Erica Slaughter. When I first heard about this concept, I absolutely fell in love with it. It's a great blend of horror and action. The art is fantastic. And not to mention, Erica Slaughter is like the coolest name ever. Like, holy shit. I've been a fan of James Tynan's work for a long time. His run on Rebirth Detective Comics was great. And fun fact, it is pronounced Tynan, not Tinian. I checked. Netflix is apparently working on a show based on it. Mike Flanagan was involved, but he left for creative differences, so who knows if it'll end up in development hell. But I would love to see this world and its characters brought to life, including the two spin-off books, House of Slaughter and Book of Butcher. I've been told that I'm supposed to be repurposing my longer videos for, like, shorts and TikToks. 
So am I gonna have to say something is unaliving the children? This is gonna sound like I'm a crazy person, but I really love the ways that Invincible uses its violence. It's not just for shock value, but helps to give the show an identity of its own. Each punch feels painful and real and consequential because of that. And that makes the action scenes all the more satisfying. It's the perfect way to bring to life the same level of bloodshed from the comics that only animation could accomplish. And a book that has that same level of brutal action is Headlopper. Created, written, and illustrated by Andrew McLean, edited by Aaron McLean with colors by Mike Spicer and Jordi Belair, and letters by Andrew and Aaron McLean. This book is about a Viking swordsman named Norgal, dubbed the Headlopper, and his companion, the severed head of Agatha Blue Witch, as they travel across the Nordic realm and, well, lop some heads. I love me some good Norse stories, and I'm just a sucker for, like, the silent protagonist. The dynamic between Norgal and the head's constant nagging is really fun. Same with just how over the top this book is. There's a lot of really great humor injected throughout, and I just absolutely love the art style. Now, I'm a little biased because I actually know Andrew and Aaron McLean. A friend of mine who will go unnamed got me in contact with them. Matt Draper. It was Matt Draper. And I've been helping to edit videos for their Kickstarter campaigns for their newer comics, Death Fight Forever and Snarlagon, which are also really fun books that I am shamelessly representing right now because they sent me a shirt because they're the coolest. Uh, they're really great people. I'm a huge fan of everything they make, but this could make for a really fun animated series. I get very strong like Gendy Tartakovsky vibes from it, like a sort of sillier version of Samurai Jack or Primal. One of the things that the Invincible comic has always tried to tackle is the more complex ideas and the moral ambiguity that comes with being a superhero. Questioning what's right and what's wrong and the best ways that someone like Mark should use his powers for good. The comic hasn't always handled some of these ideas perfectly. A lot of the time, it just felt like a mouthpiece for whatever Kirkman wanted to talk about that day, but I'll say the book was still really brave for tackling those ideas at the time and the show is looking to be improving upon them and I think that's a mark of a great adaptation. And in the same vein of moral ambiguity, a more recent book that made the cut is Canary, written by Scott Snyder, art and colors by Dan Panosian, and letters by Richard Starkings. Much to my disappointment when I first saw the sign for it at Comic-Con, this book is not about Black Canary, but it's the next best thing. In the final days of the Old West, random killings are disturbing the peace in a small town called Canary. People are going mad and murdering their neighbors, and after a student brutally kills his teacher with a hatchet, it, Marshal William Holt comes to investigate. If there's one thing I love more than a good horror comic, it's a good horror comic with cowboys, baby. The book has a lot of similar vibes to something like the first Red Dead Redemption. This idea of the Old West dying and society becoming more civilized and people not being sure how to react to that, all added in with these splashes of gothic horror and thriller. And I think this could make a great Western horror series. And honestly, I just need more Westerns in the world. Is that a crime? Scott Snyder is of course great. His run on Batman is legendary, but I also love American Vampire and I'll always support whatever he works on next. I really love the overall universe of Invincible. What at first seems like just a parody of the superhero genre complete with its own knockoff Justice League was able to grow and change into an interesting world on its own. The Viltrumites and their lore, Midnight City that's completely shrouded in a 24 hour nighttime, the Martians and the Cichwids, Battle Beasts just like as a concept. There's so many unique ideas and touches that make the world so special and interesting aside from all of the other commentaries on superhero media that it makes. And a world that I would love to see get brought to life is from The White Trees, written by Chip Zdarsky with art by Chris Anka, colors by Matt Wilson, and letters by Aditya Bidikar. In the fantasy world of Black Sand, three warriors reunite after 20 years, putting aside their old wounds to try and locate their children who've been abducted. I think my favorite part of this book is the things that it has to say about violence and trauma, but also how it gets right to the point. So many fantasy stories really overwhelm you with a lot of lore and info dumping right at the beginning, and that makes the story very muddied with exposition. But here, despite being thrust into this completely new world with unfamiliar names and places, the core task is one that's incredibly clear and understandable, and the world building comes naturally off of that. I firmly believe that Chip Zdarsky is one of the best writers working today. His Daredevil run specifically is fantastic and I think will go down in history as one of the best comic runs ever made. And Chris Anka is also great. The art in this book is just gorgeous. I've been a fan of his for a long time with his work on things like The Runaways and X-Men. He's even made some of the best Fortnite loading screens and the character designs for Across the Spider-Verse. And I'm not just saying that because he supports the channel by paying me $2 a month and in return gets early videos, scripts, and behind the scenes updates and a dedicated Discord server. But you can get all that too at patreon.com slash troyboy17, link in the description. Thank you, Chris, for letting me make this plug completely organically. I think nowadays we're in dire need of some more fantasy stories. Like, I feel like everyone's trying to be the new gritty Game of Thrones type show, but I really want to see the more fantastical world of Black Sand and its characters come to life in some way. The book is super short. It's literally just two issues with another three issue mini coming in May. So it could make a great animated movie or maybe expand it into some kind of mini series. Speaking of Chip Zdarsky, I would love it if his book Public Domain could get some more love. It's written by Chip Zdarsky, art by Chip Zdarsky, colors by Chip Zdarsky, and letters by, oh, hey, would you look at that, Chip Zdarsky. The book is about a comic artist who, after helping to create the world's most popular superhero that's getting adapted adapted into billion dollar movies isn't seeing a single cent from it. But after finding old paperwork, learns that he legally owns 100% of the rights and the profits from the character. It's clear that after years of writing for the big two, Chip has some... 
critiques of the comics industry. Comic book creators, to put it simply, don't get the recognition that they deserve. They work incredibly hard, putting in blood, sweat, and tears to create these stories for this medium, only to have their work completely ripped out from them. And despite the IP making billions of dollars at the box office, they don't see any of that because that's just how the industry works. It's why I'm doing my best to mention the colorists and the letters in this video, because they never get credited when people talk about comics, despite basically being the backbone of the entire industry. Like a comics colorist can make or break a book's art, and I don't think people talk about them enough. And so public domain is this very personal story that's clearly trying to bring some of those industry problems to the surface. I don't know necessarily how well it could be adapted since it's very specifically about comics. And I think taking it out of that medium would sort of detract from the overall point that the book's trying to make, but it's a great story and I could not mention it. One thing about Invincible that I absolutely love, it's probably my favorite part of the show, is the voice acting. Steven Yun is delivering a performance on that show that is completely on another level. The dude is walking circles around even JK fucking Simmons and the rest of that stacked all-star cast. I think he's a huge reason for Mark's likability and popularity, and the same goes for all the other characters. And a book that could also shine from a similar cast is Radiant Black, written by Kyle Higgins, art and colors by Marcelo Costa, and letters by Becca Carey. The book follows Nathan Burnett, a struggling writer who's in a crippling amount of debt, who discovers a cosmic power called the Radiant and becomes a superhero called Radiant Black. There's of course some other crazy shit that happens with a ton of new hero characters, and it's a part of Image Comics' interconnected universe called the Massive Verse. If we're talking about the invincible treatment literally, this book is as close to another invincible as we're probably going to get. In the same way that Robert Kirkman blended Spider-Man and Superman stories with Invincible, Kyle Higgin blends Spider-Man, Nightwing, and Power Rangers, while also putting a cool original spin on it, which is funny because he also wrote for Power Rangers. It, it, that, was, that was also a good run too. But specifically with Nathan's story, it really goes into the pain and the dread that comes with that level of money problems in ways that even a lot of modern Spider-Man stories aren't willing to do, and I love that. Literally the first page is Nathan sitting in his car, looking at his bank account and crying, which not to sound like a millennial or anything, but that's... I don't... I wrote this in the script and I have to say it. That's a total mood. I hate myself. I hate myself. I've been a fan of this book from day one. I love how much it's grown and the sort of meta commentary that it makes on legacy characters. And it's really just one adaptation away from being a household name like Invincible. Give me Radiant Black in Fortnite, please. There was a five minute animated short film with Radiant Black being voiced by Terry fucking McGinnis. And once the book's finished up, I'd love to see an animated series in that same style. Speaking of Terry McGinnis, Maybe, 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 maybe I'm working on a Batman Beyond video, who knows? And it wouldn't be an Invincible video if I didn't talk about the animation. Listen, I get it. The wait for season two has been difficult and the break in the middle of it after four episodes is definitely harder. I completely get that. And I honestly think that they should have just waited for season two to be done and then release it all in one go. But with that said, I'm really glad that the animators and the people working on the show aren't being overworked to death like so many other animated properties. Is the animation some perfect one-to-one -one recreation of the most detailed splash pages? No, of course not. Anim Animating something like this isn't even close to being feasible. But that's okay, because in motion, the show is doing such a great job at replicating the overall feel and tone of Ryan Otley's artwork, and on the whole, I love what it's doing with visuals. And a comic that I would love to see get visually adapted in the same way, and the last indie comic that I think deserves the invincible treatment, is Klaus. Written by Grant Morrison, with art by Dan Mora, colors by Doug Campos, and letters by Ed Dukeshire. The best way I can describe Klaus is, what if Santa Claus was the coolest dude ever and was written by Grant Morrison. That's really the best way to describe it. It's very like Green Arrow or Golden Age Superman and how it approaches the character, making Santa Claus this superhero champion of the working class and the oppressed. He's draped in this sick red cloak and his sleigh is pulled around by a bunch of huge wolves. The world building and the mythology are just top notch. It's more than just another Santa Claus origin. Grant Morrison is one of my favorite comic writers of all time. All-Star Superman is probably the best comic book ever made. I've said it before, but that shit should be taught in schools. I love all of Grant Morrison's work their book, Super Gods, is like life-changing. It's made me totally rethink how I view superhero media. I love it. And on top of that, Dan Mora is genuinely one of the best artists in the industry. There's a reason DC snatched him up to draw for all their books, and Klaus is no exception. This is clearly a passion project for the two of them, and you can feel it in every fiber of it. Especially this one shot, The Life and Times of Joe Christmas. If you don't read anything else from the series, I'm begging you to at least just read that book. Each page is a snapshot in the life of this man, in beautiful full-page spreads as he ages but Klaus doesn't. But the story goes backwards, starting at 70 and going to his birth, so if you read it front to back, you get a completely different experience from reading it back to front. It's such a great use of the comics medium and says so much about love and friendship, and I love it so much. I know it's like the beginning of April, 
the, I lost track of time with this video. Oh my God. So I don't think anybody's in the mood for Christmas stuff yet. But like the second Mariah Carey breaks out of that ice block, I need every single one of you to pick this book up. Now I've spent this whole video comparing these comics to Invincible. And I know that the whole premise is comics that deserve the Invincible treatment. But I want to make it very clear that I don't think any comic needs to be adapted. There are a lot of people who think that comic books exist solely to be turned into movies and TV shows. That they're nothing more than a testing ground for potential IPs and streaming services. And any comic that doesn't get adapted is completely worthless. And that's really frustrating to me as a lover of the storytelling medium and for all the people who have poured their hearts and their souls into telling stories for it. Comic creators have consistently been screwed over despite how hard they work and how much money their stories bring in for massive corporations. I've been putting so much of an emphasis on the creative teams behind these books, specifically because I want you all to get to know the people behind these stories. And that's why I'm so happy with Invincible's success. Because even though it's not like Robert Kirkman was some struggling comic writer or anything, the dude created The Walking Dead, this adaptation of a creator-owned comic is so successful largely largely because the original creators were so heavily involved with it. And we're able to see directly the benefits from that. Because of this show, millions and millions of people now know who Invincible is, who Adam Eve and Omni-Man are. They've basically become household names in the span of a couple years. They're in fucking Fortnite of all places, like in Gritty on Peter Griffin. And all of that success is driving people to read and buy the comic and engage more with those original stories. And I can only hope for that same kind of success for Radiant Black or Klaus or any of these comics. Adaptations of comics should exist in tandem with the source material, a self-fulfilling cycle that gets people more interested in reading comics, talking about comics, and inspiring people to create comics and create more art. I think focusing on that is the best way to help creators, that's the best way to help the industry, and that's the Invincible Treatment. But what indie comics do you think deserve more of a spotlight? I know that comic videos don't always do well, so if you like this video, be sure to let the YouTube algorithm know and hit the like button and subscribe. Special thanks to Alta the Sting, Anz, Cabbage Boy, Cassidy, Caroline Brenneman, Chicken McDoofus, Cooked C, Cosmic Tragedy, Danny Boy, Dreamer Who, Eden Kenna, Egan McFarlane, Hannah C, Howard Bell, Iron Ninja, Jake Stellig, Corey's Not Fresh, Glass Bear Productions, Murrow 09, Pencil Fan, Popcorn Eater 123, Spectacular Clyde, Tim Newfeld, Trans Huntress, Tyler Goodrich, and Yush Kapoor for being spectacular fanboys on my Patreon. This has been Troy Boy 17 coming at you live and I'll see you around.